I never said this thing was a race. Anyone, someone would use the term race. But no, no, it's not a race. It's an event. I'm just going to try and finish the event. I'm not, I'm not racing anyone or anything. But I soon found out that it was a race, um, but it was a race against time to make all the different checkpoints. I felt like I'd actually disrespected um, the challenge and, and what the event was. Welcome to Shaz Jackson. This is my crib. The kitchen, dining room, bedroom is over here. There's the toilet here. There's the most important thing is the coffee machine, which is here. Owen, legit, you like it. Lovely. <laughs> right, here we are, lots of, lots of lovely messages, which is amazing. But Shawzy, good luck, mate. You'll smash it. Which, I'm feeling the love, definitely. But the trouble is like I don't know if I'm gonna smash it because only I know what training I've done and I don't know if that's enough because I've never done this thing before. <laughs> so um, the unknown, the unknown is scary. Yeah. Oh. I guess start from not being able to run after my brain injury that I had in 2013, which ended my rugby career. Just two of us on the same team in, in the warm-up trying to catch the same ball. It was just a nothingness collision, but I had a seizure and a small bleed in the brain. Our brain pretty much controls everything that we're, we're doing to a degree, and it just meant any sort of task was hard. Even just something like being sensitive to light and then the fatigue, and then there was the sort of like emotional side of it of like depression and things like that, classic sort of um, symptoms of, of brain injuries. But it was years later where I discovered the importance of training the breath to, to help with my brain injury like recovery. Improving the way that we breathe to help with oxygen and blood supply to the brain, which gets affected typically during head injuries and brain injuries. Keep it nasal. The Ring of Fire, it's, a, it's an ultra marathon, 135 miles, 216 kilometers, with uh, 4,000 meters of elevation over the three days, running around the entire Anglesey coastal path. I mentioned about my father being from North Wales and that being an important part of the event being in, in, in Anglesey. And he died recently. But yeah, we saw him, we saw him took his last breath. And seeing, yeah, seeing someone take that, take that last breath and then they're gone. It's opened up so many questions in my mind. And we enter this life and take our first breath and we finish with that final one. And I think that the, the thing that's resonating through my, my mind at the moment is what we're doing in between those breaths. I'm not professing to be an ultra runner and 
my running hadn't been and my training hadn't been about trying to be good uh, at ultra running. My training and my running had always been about connecting to myself and, and training, training my breath to, to improve the way, that, the way that I breathe. Trying to do a multi-day event for me was really, you have to be able to run that first day to the point where you can go again the next day. So it wasn't like about pushing your limits, it was about how fresh can you keep yourself rather than just hammering yourself and see if you can just hammer yourself further and hammer yourself further. That didn't feel like it was good for the body or, or healing for the body. So I focused very much on the improving the efficiency of how I was breathing, with the nasal breathing connected to the diaphragm, and trying to finish a training session or a run and feel like you could just go and do it all over again. I mean, I don't know how anyone else is doing it without bandana on. Is that a wicking sweater, right? Bandanas give you 23% increase in endurance. Science. Look at every look at every top tennis player there's ever been. McEnroe, Agassi, Federer. We all wear bandanas. Everyone's missed a trick. I think that what what became apparent was the challenge within the Ring of Fire meant that <laughs> a lot of that got blown out of the water, <laughs> which there was a number of things that I was totally unprepared for. That was significantly harder than I anticipated. The three days of the Ring of Fire are made up of 16 different checkpoints. And the thing with any of the checkpoints, it doesn't matter how far you've gone or how well you've been previously doing, if you don't make a checkpoint, um, that's it, you are, you are timed out. Part of my poor preparation was, I didn't look at the, those all the timings over those different checkpoints until about two weeks before the event, which added a level of, of stress cognitively that took me a long time to get comfortable with. I never said this thing was a race. Anyone, someone would use the term race. I'd be like, no, no, it's not a race, it's an event. I'm just going to try and finish their event. I'm not, I'm not racing anyone or anything. But I soon found out that it was a race, um, but it was a race against time to make all the different checkpoints. The stress of nearly not making them. I was totally not ready for because all of my training had never been, I'd never put pressure on myself to like, right, you're going to try and do this run in this amount of time.
it's been, I think it's been tight. It was always do this run on managing your breath, your heart rate, and like the time will be what the time will be. Not trying to push myself to get better at, at running. I fucking hate the checkpoint. It can be really difficult to think positively when you're in a bad space mentally. Like I was in a bad space mentally because I was in a bad place physically, but then I had all these emotions around not being good enough, not deserving to be there, you know, feeling like I disrespected the whole event and the whole thing and everyone there. I got to a point where I could, I could take a step, but everything else, I was completely vulnerable and reliant on another person. The events ended up sort of like forcing me into that mental and physical place. I didn't take myself there. I didn't even necessarily want to go there or think I was going there or the purpose of the whole event wasn't to go there. But I found myself there and totally relying on, a, on another person. You know, they were doing actual things to like help me have a drink, have food, get to the next thing, navigate, be in front, encourage me through that just without those things I wouldn't have um, I wouldn't have been able to like take my next step. Honestly, how bad is the last 10? Uh, not bad at all. Like, it's just, it was actually like quite a, a beautiful thing in the, as an adult, when does that happen? Like, the world doesn't tell us, like, it's okay to be in that much need of someone else. It was almost like being a baby again and you were just totally dependent on somebody being able to look after you because you are a baby. I was just very blessed that um, that person was, was my wife. Signed up for a three-day event. Yes, buddy. Yes. It was only after we finished that I was like, I feel like you were there most of the time on day two. Like, when did you join me? She was like, Yeah, you were pretty broken. And I just felt like you needed me. If there's a coffee shop, get us a single espresso, would you? Yep. So like working out, like you've roughly done about 80 miles in three days, not mentally prepared to do more than just a little bit of support. And the furthest you'd run before this was like 15 miles. Yeah, where's that come from? Like, what's the override that allows someone to like, go to that place and, and do that. And I think that, that that override is called love. 
You know your wife loves you when she brings you protection. For, I don't know for other people, but for me, I've experienced the like. The strength is in vulnerability. The, the connection and like deep connection with people is like needing them, like needing them because you cannot do it on your own. And that's not only is that not a bad thing, like that's a good thing. I'm left like craving more connection. So it's 4.30 a.m. in the morning of day three, and I wake up in the camper van, and I say wake up, I'd fallen asleep, I think, two or three times for five or 10 minutes through the night, and I just couldn't envisage getting out of bed, let alone anything else. And I, and I turned to Catherine and I was like, I can't, I can't do it. And she said to me, if you don't try, you'll regret it. I did what any good husband does, you listen to your wife. So I got out of bed I gingerly made my way into, uh, into my sister's house, which was base camp. I didn't even have enough energy to, to close the toilet door. My sister came downstairs. I said, Susie, I, I can't do it. And she said the most beautiful thing. She said, just try and get in the car. That's the first step. I can try and do that. I can try and get in the car. Because that doesn't mean I'm going to start. Definitely doesn't mean I'm going to finish. But she gave me an actionable step. And just like Catherine, Mrs. Jacko, she, it was try. Try and get up. Try and get in the, in the car. I think there's some massive lessons in that there for me. Something I completely hadn't considered. You can always break something down further. And it, and, it, and it started there. Got to where the race briefing was going to be for that final day. Sort of hot, literally hobbled in and sort of my levels of em embarrassment and felt like I disrespected those other, those people that were there and deserved to be there because they was in a state to actually like take on this, this final day. All that negative talk and, and thoughts came back like, why are you so stupid, like idiot? Why did you think you could come to an event like this? What we're gonna say to the two sponsors of the documentary, like there is, there is no story. And I was just thinking of the, the best case scenario. Like I'm here now, so I'll walk out the door. And I was thinking, well, I'm never gonna get to I'm never gonna get to the first checkpoint in time. Just get timed out and maybe we can just walk the rest of it. And at least we'll do the distance, we'll just however long it takes, like to just walk really slowly. <laughs> at least we've finished and done the distance I'd come to do that. That was sort of like what I thought might be the best case. And as the rain was like hammering into his face with the 20 mile an hour winds from this storm apparently, the first kilometre might have taken us 20 minutes or the first half 500 metres took 10 minutes or something, just like painfully slow. It almost couldn't get any worse. We're gonna get timed out anyway, like, 
why don't why don't we just try and get it over with a bit quicker? It was almost like just going at this slow was just yeah more painful. So just tried to take some some faster steps and like one thing turned into another and we're running. Catherine was ahead as she sort of always was. And I was like, Catherine, I'm running. <laughs> I actually felt like I was running pretty, pretty good. Catherine was like, look, there's some people ahead. And I could see that they were walking and said, let's catch those fucking walkers. I was in a bit of a survival mode. We overtook them and it was like, we might actually make this checkpoint. And it was a wicked feeling. I think it was the, it was the best feeling. A couple of hundred meters before getting to this first checkpoint. And I was like, I am back, baby. <laughs> it was like, I'm back for the dead. I didn't think I was gonna make this at all. Not a single ounce of me. I was then in this like buoyant mood again. It was like the roller coaster was then going to start. We've made this first checkpoint now. Well, if we've done this first one, like, why can't we do the second one? If we can do the second one, we can do the third one. Once you hit that third one, like the last one, like psychologically, always feels. Better. Good luck. There was something that my dad used to say to me when um, when he was coaching us at, at rugby. Like, not showing what you've got too early because in rugby, like, when you're playing against a bit of a nasty team, someone will take you out physically. So it was like, save it to the end. And it was like, show them what you've got at the end. And for some reason, that, that message was going around my head on day three. Um, and when we came off the, the back of the, the side of the mountain, as you come round, you can see the finish line is maybe like 300 meters or something to go. I was just like sprinting. After all that distance and like how I was like, I was like limping every time I was walking, but like all of a sudden I'm like sprinting. That is just an experience of going like, you are far more capable than we could possibly ever think. I went into, into this event saying it wasn't a race and it turned into a race against time. I went into it looking for like a deep connection with myself because I was going to go through all of these struggles. And what I've come out with was those, those deep connections with everyone around. It isn't about, it wasn't about the event, it wasn't about me doing it. Like I didn't do it, I redid it. We connected deeply. That's been the, the magic of the experience and what it's, what it's about. That's why I like smile about when I reflect back and we, and we talk about what we did and 
we laugh about all the different struggles and things that we that we went through. Where can we choose to let our guard down, choose to be vulnerable? And when someone lets their guard down or shows me their vulnerability that I can then reciprocate it the other way. As I reflect on what that event that's turned into experience has been about, I think that's that's what I'm left with. What between breaths means to me now, to breathe is there to allow us to live. And in allowing us to live, it's an opportunity to connect. <laughs>